welcome to lecture 20 and the final lecture of uh, optical sensors course. Uh, today we are going to discuss two different things, one is terahertz waves and their applications in detection and the other part will be on dichroism, uh, in particular circular dichroism and then uh, how uh, bio materials and bio respond to this kind of uh, where you have polarization and all these things involved. If you remember in the last lecture we discussed uh, the optical response of various biomaterials say for example, uh, DNA, uh, proteins, fat and uh, we also discussed their uh, various absorption windows and uh, we concluded that uh, if they are absorbing in the spectral window what you can do is that you can calculate absorption coefficients and absorption cross sections from there and then you can determine quantitatively and qualitatively the amount of that particular biomaterial. And we took a couple of examples, uh, one was uh, hemoglobin and uh, second one was uh, bilirubin which was uh, for jaundice prediction. Okay, so, today we will go further and we will pick up one uh, very important and very hot topic of the day is uh, terahertz. Uh, now, everyone wants to do terahertz, but why? Why it is important we will see today and then how it can be useful for detection applications. So, tera means 10 to power 12. So, the frequency here is uh, of the order of 10 to power 12 per second and if you say in meters it will be 10 to power minus 3 to 10 to power minus 4 and you can see that this lies somewhere in the middle of microwaves and infrared. So, here is your NIR where you measure the bacteria and all these things and when you come to ter terahertz which is around roughly 300 micron in size. So, if you have entities below this wavelength it would not see any difference. So, that is why you can do it for sensing of whole blood cells or something. Terahertz gap, now there is a gap, I mean the field of electronics is full fledged developed and the photonics is developed full fledged, but there is a gap between uh, at a juncture okay, where electronics and photonics meet actually you do not have detector, detectors or sources in the, this particular range that is that is why it is called terahertz gap and there are no available femto, uh, femtosecond lasers also. So, this range so which is around 0 0.1 to 10 terahertz uh, means uh, 3 to about 0 0.03 millimeters of wavelength range, uh, we do not have much uh, terahertz generators and detectors. So, it is an open avenue for research and uh, lots of now research is going on to generate uh, to make terahertz generators and terahertz sources, people have succeeded also to make. Uh, laser like uh, terahertz generators or uh, polychromatic also. So, their applications we will see. Uh, what is important is that if you make this kind of thing, uh, if, if, so previously it was not available, so it restricted you know its use in uh, exploring the science and industry, but uh, nowadays it has become uh, more and more relevant. So, why it is it relevant? Because uh, they can penetrate through the medium which are even opaque to say other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that is something very beautiful. So, for example, if you have a plastic bag or board or if you have a, a briefcase, uh, uh, it can become uh, transparent uh, to some extent to this kind of waves that is the beauty of this. And uh, since they have very small energy not um, uh, as much high energy like x-rays or something. So, they do not make any substantial change in the chemical composition of the chemical structure of the analyte, it is also very important aspect and uh, you can create images as I told you that uh, uh, the briefcase is transparent to this kind of wave then you can see what is behind it. Yeah. So, it can be used for creating images also creating is, uh, and take spectroscopic data and also it is nowadays have been sought to be used in short range communication. Why? In Wi-Fi or something because now it is a 
since it's a, it has relatively higher energy than the microwaves and radio waves. So, you want to use this range of spectrums to enhance the Wi-Fi signals, it will be enhanced communication. So, the data rates will be larger, better. And uh, more importantly, you can study uh, rotational spectra and vibration transitions uh, using this, because it is uh, on the verge of far IR. So, you can still have uh, you know combinational an analysis of materials which are like lie between microwave and IR. So, that, that, that is the beauty of uh, terahertz. So, for example, you can see that this man uh, in a general image uh, is carrying a paper, but if you uh, look uh, using terahertz, what you see is that it is actually carrying a knife. I mean the paper is transparent to terahertz, so you can see what is behind it. So, see how beautiful it is. So, you see a few applications. Uh, when it comes to tissues, for example, you have taken the uh, couple of tissues, this is normal skin and uh, this is a fat tissue and you see that their absorption coefficients in terahertz region are different. So, even if they look same, they have di different uh, absorption, because they have different refractive indices in this region. So, it is very easy to see uh, how it changes. So, uh, in terahertz. You can use it for biomedical imaging. For example, if, if you have a, a cell, a part of it is has some disease and, uh, and then you can see that uh, in the Im imaging that uh, disease tissue has shown these areas which are uh, highlighted in color and uh, normal tissue does not have this disease. So, it is like that. Here is an ex another example from TerraView company where th they did an imaging of uh, a tooth. So, in visible light you see that uh, okay, it is a fine tooth, but when you see with terahertz you find that okay, no there is a cavity in the human tooth. So, and you can um, determine uh, by change, changing the wavelength of it, you can assess various uh, contrast images and then you can know that what is the size of the cavity and what is the depth also. So, these are uh, kind of examples which uh, show that uh, how useful it is. We will come to more examples. But uh, let us say what is terahertz time domain spectroscopy. So, this is a spectroscopy which measures actually the absorption spectra with and without the sample from the ter terahertz pulse. So, uh, what you do is that, that you measure the absorption and dispersion of the sample by using Fourier transform. So, it gives you both I mean amplitude as well as the phase. So, what is there actually you have a, a femtosecond laser which excites pulses and then you have an emitter which emits uh, from this femtosecond laser you get the terahertz source. So, it becomes, becomes a terahertz source and then you have it pass through the sample and uh, you have another pulse from the femtosecond which uh, is actually a probe source. So, it uh, takes care of how much change in phase occurred. Okay. So, that is how you uh, use it for time domain spectrometry. There are various applications of terahertz. So, one of them is differentiating the molecules. So, suppose I have two molecules which are almost similar in chemical composition say we have chosen say glucose and fructose. So, they are almost same in uh, chemical composition. There is only one difference that it has an aldehyde group and it has a ketone group that is it. So, most of the bonds are basically similar like C H bond, C O H bond, C and uh, so that is why you see that in IR spectra you do not see much difference, they are all same, almost same for glucose and fructose. While in terahertz you see that they both have distinct uh, absorption curves. So, that is the beauty, I mean uh, you can differentiate between two molecules which are even similar uh, in a uh, in IR spectroscopy in terahertz you can see that okay, they are distinguishable. You can use uh, it for tracing of illegal drugs or narcotics, why because uh, this uh, has many vibrational and rotational modes which uh, fall in this region. So, it can be used to you know excite those rotational and vibrational modes and then you can say okay, this is at this particular compound, I mean it is like similar to uh, IR or uh, uh, rotational spectroscopy. So, for example, here uh, you can see that uh, this is a uh, base cocaine and uh, cocaine hydrochloride and MDMA different kinds of and heroin and morphine. 
So, these are have different uh, uh, absorption curves in terahertz and uh, that means that uh, if you have a matrix of uh, elements from there you can say that okay, we have a cocaine or cocaine chloride, hydrochloride or morphine or heroin and also based on the absorbance you can say that how much. So, it can tell you qualitatively and quantitatively both because it has a distinct signature in terahertz as, as you can see that all of them have different uh, distinct signatures. So, you can directly relate it to what kind of material it is and then even you do not need to open the box if uh, you are if you remember that I told you that terahertz can penetrate through certain plastic or uh, material. So, if you have a box full of uh, narcotics okay, you can or illegal drugs you can immediately tell that what kind of drug is in the box without even opening it. You see, so uh, there are uh, different uh, materials have different uh, spectral signatures. It can be used for uh, tracing explosives. So, here you see that uh, if you are hiding a, an explosive you hardly can see from outside, but by using terahertz you can say okay, if, if it illuminates the body with terahertz you can say okay, now I am getting some signals which means you have something here and then you open it the zip and you find ok there are explosives. You can see the absorption spectra of SX2 and RDX here and PETN and you see that they are different. So, again uh, they are it is not just narcotics, but also uh, explosives also have distinct absorption spectra in terahertz region. So, without using any sophisticated mechanism for making a sensor what you can immediately do is that you sign on terahertz light and uh, detect uh, the spectra and or, or can do an imaging and using both you can say that okay, you have uh, this uh, particular uh, explosive even from a range you do not need to be near the person. Okay. It is used in biology also and medicine. So, here are a couple of uh, examples. So, this because water has a strong absorption in 1 to 3 terahertz that means that terahertz radiation can detect the difference in water content. So, suppose you have couple of tissues and one of it has larger water content than the other then uh, if you do a surface profiling then you know that uh, you can convert it into an image and that will give you the surface features of that particular surface. If on, on my hand if I have uh, inflammation or something probably the water content will be different from uh, the normal tissue and that you can do easily using um, imaging from terahertz. There is another example of uh, detecting pharmaceuticals. So, in pharmaceutical industry you have uh, say one example is endomethacin which is an anti inflammatory drug and you see that the amorphous and crystalline structures of it have different absorbance in terahertz region. So, uh, Suppose you want to make a, a drug, a, 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 a tablet of this particular drug, and then you come out, oh, okay, no, it is not crystalline, it is an amorphous one, and I do not want amorphous one. So, it is not just that, okay, you uh, determine the chemical composition, but also it is the crystallinity which makes an impact here uh, uh, when you measure the absorbance spectra in terahertz region. That is something very important because the same compound has different absorption spectra and uh, that determines I mean you, you sometimes you do not want uh, amorphous ones or crystalline ones or uh, vice versa. So, that helps us choose what kind of phase also of the same material is required for making a pharmaceutical. Confirmation of diabetes using terahertz foot measurement what it means it means like you can see here that uh, a lady is sitting here and uh, beneath her foot. Uh, there are sensors for uh, terahertz imaging and uh, then they are photographed and uh, you can see that uh, based on the water content level this is one uh, normal one this is the diabetic one and you can see that in easily that how much is the difference. And based on this imaging technique not only you can say that okay, a person is diabetic or not, but you can also say that how much is the blood glucose concentration. So, it is both, qual both qualitative as well as quantitative. Okay. 
So, it also can be used for imaging. So, if you have a minute crack in the ceramic, you can do an imaging and you can see that okay, the crack you can see here, uh, which was here. Uh, sometimes it can detect even minor cracks. I mean, when I am talking about it is a few microns cracks I am talking about, which are not uh, visible through eye. You can also see concealed knife under the sole of a shoe. So, uh, this is the normal picture of the shoe sole, and uh, this is the picture taken using terahertz. And okay, then you say, okay, no, you have knife, and then you take off the sole, and then you find, okay, the knife is here. So, this is, I mean, this can be used in defense. You know, it's a, at security checks. It's something very important. This is visible image of an uh, integrated chip, and you can see that. Uh, if you do in terahertz, you can see all the connections and the, if they are connected, well connected or not. Sometimes, when you do a manufacture, you can use, you can see that okay, there is, there is a, you don't see any connection here. Sometimes, sometimes this leg is not working. So you know that uh, using terahertz, okay, uh, for quality test, that okay, this chip is good or not. Here's another example. So this is a chocolate box when uh, imaged with terahertz. You see that one of the chocolate bars is, is missing. So if you go to a supermarket, suppose you have you have a, a terahertz scanner, then you will know that okay, if whatever I am buying and in a packaged a packaged food or packaged any item, if it has the same quantity or quality or not. So these are some of the uses which uh, uh, we can uh, where we can use for terahertz and uh, use the spectroscopy technique. Here is an use of terahertz uh, TDS, which we already discussed, and uh, using this technique, you can read through a book without opening it. So here, here what they did is that they took nine pages, and uh, each uh, each pa page was of uniform thickness, and then they wrote this letter T H Z something something this, this on nine pages, and they made a stack with every uh, every paper uh, with a gap of 20 micron and the thickness of each paper was 300 micron and on the backs of, of it it was written there and the reflective indices of the gap is n0 and the, the that one of the paper is n1 and n0 and n1 so forth so using a motorized state and uh, using tds you can say that uh, you can image each page and uh, what you do is that you take a time gated Fourier transform to assess this information from terahertz signal that uh, uh, what is there on the back of each of the pages even without uh, opening the stack. Let us see what is dichroism. So, this was all about uh, terahertz till now that uh, we studied that uh, what is terahertz and what are the miracles it can do. Oh, there is something wrong here, I will, I will write it correctly. So, if you have a material and you sign with two orthogonal polarizations, say uh, what I am signing is it I parallel and I perpendicular, what happens actually that uh, out of these two uh, polarizations absorbs one of the polarizations larger, stronger than uh, the other. So, what will happen is that it will lead to change in the polarization direction because now the polarization components have changed. So, suppose uh, you had polarizations like this and at an angle theta and suppose you can have I perpendicular and I, I parallel and I perpendicular which are given by I cos theta and I sin theta and now what you see is that this I cos theta and I sin theta have changed because now the intensities and in, uh, parallel and perpendicular components have changed. So, what you get that the absorptions are different and that is called dichroism. When it is for linear polarization, it is called la linear dichroism. So, that is defined by absorption parallel difference absorption perpendicular divided by absorption parallel plus absorption perpendicular. That is that is the linear dichroism. Forget about this. Okay, when it comes to circular polarizations, so it is basically the difference 
between the absorption of left and right handed circular polarized lights. So, you have RCP, you have LCP and their difference. So, suppose one of them so says the blue one is left circular polarization, red one is for right circular polarization, then what you get is the difference of these two that is the green one, this gives the dichroism. So, from the absorption spectra for two orthogonal polarizations, you can say you can extract the information about the dichroism property of materials. So, if you have a circular polarization, then it is circular dichroism. Uh, so, it is depicted here. So, suppose you have a beam which has a green one and red ones are showing two different polarizations, say right and left circular polarizations, and they are e equal in magnitude. And once it is incident on an optically active sample, what happens actually that the green the the red one has absorbed more that means, the right one and the left circular polarization is not absorbed more. So, it is showing a large component here. So, this is the difference between the absorptions and that can be converted in terms of the absorption coefficient for right and left circular polarized light divided by the concentrations. So, you get this relation this gives the circular dichroism of this material. Let us uh, emphasize it more. So, C D was like difference between the left and right circular polarized absorptions. It is not absorption, but it can also be a difference between the absorption coefficients. So, what happens actually that now you have you have linear polarization, you can convert it into two orthogonal polarization circular polarizations that is left elliptical polar left circular polarized and right circular polarized. It passes through the material and then it superimposes again, what will happen? You will get an elliptically polarized light. You shown on it a linear polarized light at 45 degrees. So, it has like a both a right and left circular polarized lights and then you get elliptical polarization from it. So, in practice in C D spectroscopy, ellipticity is measured by the difference in absorption coefficients given by this relation, where the this constant here is given is around 33 and uh, if you solve for it using molar ellipticity and all these values, the sign in C d is this. So, it is basically delta epsilon which is the difference in the absorption coefficients by refringence. So, why it comes actually why we will get circular dichroism or dichroism because you have bi refringence. Bi refringence means uh, now the molecules are anisotropic and they are responding uh, differently for uh, different polarizations. One of the examples is I mean uh, since we are considering here bio uh, bio materials. So, it is uh, collagen fibers. So, you have some orientation order that will give you form by refringence and this form by refringence has a polarization dependence. So, you can create for by refringence. In a cell membrane you see that uh, it has I, I am showing a mosaic model where you can see that uh, it is made up of uh, something uh, li similar to li lyotropic liquid crystals. So, this consists of uh, these double layers of proteins and uh, all we have to think about is this uh, um, organization of this uh, protein la layers which are like liquid crystals. So, they are rod shaped and uh, they will behave for light falling uh, of this polarization differently than this polarization. So, you can have bi refringence in cell membranes also. So, it is very important if you are going even to study the uh, skin or or uh, any other bio material, uh, you have to consider uh, the polarization dependence also. So, it is very important that you know that uh, C D. So, all you all you care about is that okay, you, you send two orthogonal polarizations and all at the end of uh, in the reflection or in transmission you see that how much change occurred and from there you can conclude about the structure or the dichroism involved in the structure. 
by refringence you can have periodic structures which basically form to uh, have different uh, reflective indices along uh, different polarizations. So, if you have uh, its elongation in the z direction what you see is that the T e is given along z and T m is perpendicular to this uh, stack. So, they will have different reflective indices uh, which are given by this relation if you want to learn more about this f is the filling factor here and uh, it can be uh, consulted from uh, 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 Born and Wolf page 730. Chirality, an object is called chiral when it cannot be superimposed on its mirror image. For example, this hand, if you put this hand, its mirror image is this, if you put like this, it does not superimpose. You have this, its mirror image will be its opposite like this, if you put on there, it will not superimpose. These kind of objects are called chiral, this kind of objects are called achiral like their mirror image can be superimposed on it. So, in uh, English if you want to see the letters like T, I, O, these are all a chiral, R is chiral, C is chiral, E is chiral like this. So, there is a relation between chirality and symmetry, if the molecule is asymmetric or say dissymmetric then they are chiral. So, for example, this molecule you can see that they do not superimpose on each other. So, what it means is that, uh, that uh, uh, if you have symmetry then the molecule is a chiral and it makes and it is determined by the rotation axis of improper rotation. So, if it is followed by the reflection and plane perpendicular to this axis maps the molecule onto itself, this molecule is a chiral, if it does not do that then it is chiral. Enantiomers, what are enantiomers? These two forms of chiral objects which are not able to superimpose is called enantiomers together. So, enantiomers have identical physical properties because they are same, my this hand is similar to this hand, it also consists of 5 fingers, this also is a palm, this is a palm, this is the same. So, it is very difficult to you know make a qualitative analysis or quanti quantitative analysis most of the times. I gave you an example of glucose and fructose, you can see that they have similar composition group, if you write the formula for chemical formula for glucose and fructose they are same. So, they are enantiomers actually, if you superimpose them you do not get for example, this uh, alpha glucose and beta glucose if you put them together they do not superimpose. Another example is limonene or limonene S limonene, you know you see these bonds here that is the difference and it smells like lemons, it smells like oranges. So, these are different. So, it gives you optical rotation because it can rotate the plane of polarization of plane polarized light. So, let us connect it all. We were talking about circular dichroism that was all about having different absorptions. Because of different absorptions of different polarizations, in dichroism what you have is the ro rotation of the plane of polarization, that is because of chiral molecules and uh, these set of chiral molecules can be called enantiomers and they can rotate the plane of polarization of the light, they call dextro rotatory or denoted by plus sign if enantiomers is giving positive rotation. So, if it was at angle theta 1 now it is going to theta 2 and theta 1 is smaller than theta 2 then it is called dextro rotatory. 
if theta 2 is smaller than theta 1 that is called levo rotatory. So, before that it was called d rotatory or l rotatory, but now this designation now it is not used nomenclature now it is it's this thing. So, suppose you have this kind of a DNA. So, it is a chiral molecule. So, it can rotate different op polarizations in different uh, angles and based on that you can calculate the uh, circular dichroism for this. So, what happens actually that you have x and y polarizations on axis, what you can do is that you can have a circular polarized light, you can always, so it will be x plus y i y or x minus i y, you can write it like this right circular polarizations. This can be broken into two parts that are linearly polarized. So, if you remember when we were discussing polarization, I told you that any polarization can be resolved in a set of two orthogonal polarizations. So, if uh, you have x and y linear polarizations, so a circular polarization can be converted into linear polarizations x and y. Similarly, a linear polarization can be termed in terms of two orthogonal circular polarization. So, a linear polarization can be a combination of right circular polarized light and left circular polarized light. That is what I have written here. So, you have certain linear polarization, it passes through the material, suppose my DNA here and then what you get here? You have two circular polarizers at orthogonal to each other and then you are trying to see that what are the absorption coefficients for these two circular polarizations. So, these two circular polarizations propagate with different wave vectors. So, it will uh, ER will ha have a wave vector K R, EL will have vector K L. So, the total uh, superimposed one will have this wave vector. So, total field is linearly polarized rotating counterclockwise with a rate this and optical rotatory power is right handed when this is positive. It, it can be negative also as we discussed when circular dichroism. So, we will see. So, optical rotation angle is given by this relation which is dependent on N L and N R which are for uh, left circular polarized and right circular polarized lights and specific rotation is given by this relation where you have uh, concentration and d is the thickness of the cell because when if you have a larger thickness then the specific rotation will be larger and then uh, with respect to molar mass you can have this relation. So, I am giving you a, a homework that you go and calculate alpha for a normal blood glucose concentration. Okay. Now, we know that uh, if we have a molecule, it can have a, a circular dichroism and uh, it can rotate the axis of the linearly polarized light which was incident on it, because the uh, left circular polarized light and right circular polarized light they have different wave vectors, their propagation constants are different and uh, they can also move in different directions. Okay. So, what are the implications in uh, real uh, samples? So, here I have shown you the native and uh, denatured DNA uh, the C D spectra and absorption spectra here. So, you see that absorption spectra are slowly, but uh, you see the difference in absorption, but the bands are same and here also you see that uh, it can go negative also this in C D. So, the extinction coefficient I would say this uh, wavelength around 260, this is of the order of 6000 mole inverse centimeter inverse, but when it comes to difference between absorption coefficients for left and right circular polarized lights, it is only 3, so only 0.05 percent of the absorption. Thing. So, it is a very, uh, it is a very weak phenomenon, it is not easy to detect, you have to have very highly sensitive uh, spectrometers and, uh, and uh, power, power detectors. So, there are standard curves, uh, we have plotted for alpha helix beta sheet and random coil and you see that it can if this is less than 0 you have negative 1, this greater than 0 you can have positive 
value of circular dichroism. So, from there you can conclude that what is the value of circular dichroism with respect to this particular polarization. I am showing you now real uh, circular dichroism spectra of uh, uh, proteins. So, this is chymotrypsin, lysozyme, uh, trio self triose phosphate immersurase and myoglobin and you see that they have different uh, in different regions they have different circular dichroism here ok. So, let us conclude this talk today we discussed the basics of terahertz spectroscopy and its applications in large and we saw that how useful it is because of uh, that inherent range of electromagnetic spectrum we have in terahertz that uh, it can probe the rotational as well as vibrational spectra of certain molecules which cannot be done by, by other methods uh, in, in other uh, range of electromagnetic radiation. So, that that is how it becomes very useful and also uh, to for certain materials for uh, certain materials it can penetrate through it. So, so you can have non invasive detection. And Secondly, we discussed circular dichroism and also showed that uh, uh, what leads to change in the rotation and, uh, and uh, what are the factors on which it depends and how to be measure it. Something very important uh, here I want to tell about this uh, terahertz spectroscopy is that if you remember that uh, when we were discussing the even sent wave sensors or uh, surface plasmons, we, we had this penetration depth which was lambda upon 2 pi n n 1 2 pi n 1 square sin square theta 1 minus n 2 square. So, you see that uh, uh, this was this d was a proportional to lambda. So, we know that now we are working in terahertz. So, we have larger lambda. So, if you are working on a even sent wave sensor in terahertz region, what you can do is that you can probe to large distances using even sent field. So, uh, that then you can say uh, have an imaging or a spectroscopy of the using even even sent waves because it will be about of the orders of few hundreds of microns or maybe a millimeter or so because the wavelength is almost the same range of the wavelength. So, it is about more about 300 micron to or more. So, that is how you can even penetrate through and uh, uh, have a non-invasive uh, sensing using terahertz. Thank you.